Hi, this is the first part of a series that I'm going to do on reconditioning a Shoblin lathe. If you're not familiar, reconditioning refers to restoring the machine tool to its original factory accuracy and performance. It's done by various techniques that I'll show you here, but uh, the key one is scraping, where you are able to take the bearing surfaces of the motion of the machine and restore them to their factory original accuracy. Reconditioning is a really neat thing because with fairly basic hand tools, you can take any machine and bring it back to its original like new performance. While I did end up painting this one just because they're such a cute little lathe that I thought, thought it deserved it, it's performance that counts with a machine tool and that's what reconditioning is all about, recreating the factory new performance. The Shoblin 70, in my opinion, is the perfect candidate for reconditioning. Reconditioning is a lot of work and I just don't think it's worth doing unless the lathe is of a quality worthy of that kind of time and attention. Certainly the Shoblin qualifies as such and the 70 is the perfect candidate for a few reasons. First of all, it's an instrument lathe, so there's a slide rest sitting on a flat bed versus the more traditional inverted V-way lathe with a traveling carriage. So the bed is much simpler to scrape. And second of all, the overall size of the lathe is small, so the surfaces you need to scrape are likewise small. Just makes for overall more of a bite-sized project. This first section will be the shortest, dealing with the bed, as it's a fairly simple bed. And then I'll break the rest of the lathe down to in its major components, headstock, tailstock, slide rest, uh, and so on. So, without further ado, let's get into the bed. Here's the bed as I got it. While the lathe overall was a complete train wreck, the beds on these instrument makers' lathes usually aren't too bad because there's just nothing sliding along it all the time to create lots of wear. Here's a shot of the lathe bed underneath the headstock showing the fantastic scraping job that Shoblin did, I guess as you'd expect from Shoblin. I can get the same number of points per inch, but I certainly cannot get that beautiful even checkerboard type pattern. I have a quite large uh, dovetail reference flat that was perfect for this job in that the large surface covered both of the, uh, the Shoblin 70's flat uh, ways. You'll hear me refer to these as reference flats versus the more common straight edge. I just think reference flat is more, more descriptive to what it actually is than a straight edge. If you're new to scraping, it's a very simple process. You apply blue, which is kind of like an oil paint that doesn't dry, to a reference surface of known flatness, and then touch it off against the work. The blue marks on the work the high points, and then you remove those via a scraping tool. Depth of cut because of the tool geometry and the fact that it's a human exerting the force is limited to about a tenth, sometimes a bit more or less maybe when you're finishing, but about a tenth, which means that as you iteratively go back and forth from touching off the reference surface with the blue to the work removing the high points, you keep doing that over and over and over until you get coverage all over the workpiece to a certain number of points per inch. You've basically brought the workpiece to the same flatness as the, uh, the reference flat to within a tenth of a thou. So long as the reference flat is extremely flat and you can check that and tune them up and, and make them via using a surface plate as a reference flat, see, uh, the accuracy becomes as good or better than grinding. Uh, the better comes into play in that there's no force applied to the workpiece. Uh, for example, with grinding, and I know there's ways to alleviate this, but with grinding you apply a force via the mag chuck which will distort the work. When you then remove that force, the work springs back to its original shape. Now, of course, a lot of the reason for scraping on a piece like this lathe bed is I simply don't have a grinder large enough. If I did, I probably would have ground it as it's fairly simple geometry. However, the point being is that while we might scrape because we don't have a large enough grinder, it's certainly, scraping is certainly not an inferior process. Here you can see I've touched off the work with the reference flat and uh, as you would expect, the area under the headstock and the far end are high. 
I use the Biax power scraper as well as a hand scraper. I find that as I near towards the finish, the hand scraping is uh, just gives me a little more control. I'm flashing through pictures here in a few seconds, but it is an iterative process that you do over and over again until you get a high number. I think in this case I was striving for 20 per inch uh, spots per inch over the entire surface. As this surface is not a, a sliding bearing, just a, a static bearing surface, I felt that was good enough for sliding bearings. I like to get a higher point count. The other surface that matters on this lathe is the front flat surface. I'm using a camelback to scrape this while checking with the square to make sure that its surface is square to the top of the bed. The lathe originally mounts to the cast iron chip tray via three hemispherical washers. The chip tray in turn has three lugs on the bottom of it so that when it's placed on a bench and it's tightened down, no torsion or, or twist is introduced. Not having those washers, I decided to blew up the bottom of the lathe bed and scrape the chip tray into it. This probably took a lot more time in the end. I should have just made the hemispherical washers, but uh, hindsight's 2020, and with this way there won't be any uh, twist induced when you bolt the uh, bed to the chip tray. Surprise, surprise, when handling the chip tray through this process, a big hunk of it fell off in my hand. There must have been a crack here, and uh, I just grabbed it the wrong way, and uh, yeah, this needs to be fixed. I figured out how to clamp it in place while I drilled holes and then put a couple of bolts through to hold the broken piece in place for brazing. After brazing, I filed and ground away so that to restore the original profile. Uh, I used a little Fordham grinder with a burr in it, and man, that thing really threw the chips. I was impressed by how well it stood up. A little bit of Bondo, some sanding, and a blind man on a galloping horse would never notice. Because the brazing process, along with the preheat done on the chip tray, could have changed its equilibrium and geometry slightly, I decided to apply blue again to the bottom of the bed and re-scrape or just tune up the chip tray mate to the bed. And that's it. The bed and the chip tray are done. Um, certainly took longer in the doing than the telling, but uh, I promise things will get more complicated as we move forward with this project. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I'll try to get the next installment out shortly.